All right, so we're, we're live and ready to go. Welcome to the Future of Network Virtualization with VMware NSX. And I'm Bruce Davey. I'm the CTO of networking at VMware. And uh, it's, it's great to have you all here today. I, I guess maybe a few of you tried to get into my session yesterday, which was in a much smaller room. And unfortunately, that room overflowed. So I think we have plenty of room today, at least at the moment. So uh, we've got an hour, and I'm going to give you some, some forward-looking information about NSX. This is mostly about where we're going with the technology and the product. Um, but I will cover some of the, the basics just to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to see how many people here have, have been to at least one NSX session this week before this one? Great, almost everybody. So yesterday I asked that question, and like very few hands went up. So I was like, oh, I've got a advanced technical session, and I'm telling people about NSX for the first time. Uh, but So I think now you've, you've, you've had a few days to absorb NSX. I know I've spoken to some of you who've been working with it for quite a while. So this is going to be trying to take you to the next level, help you understand where we're going over the next few years. And uh, with that, uh, let me just say a few things about what I want you to get out of this session. So this is really about a future direction. You want to understand you know, this technology has a, it's, as somebody said, it's a very comprehensive product today. It's in deployment with a lot of customers today, but we do also have a lot of vision for where we're taking it in the future, and that's what I want you to take away from this session. I also hope you'll go away with a deeper understanding of the architecture, that you, know, you can add a lot of features to a product, but the architecture is pretty fundamental, and I want you to understand like, the foundation that we've built the system on top of. And I also feel I want to address some of the things that maybe people have heard about NSX that maybe aren't quite true. Uh, and you know, there's a, sometimes some confusion, and so I'd like to clear that up and help you understand exactly what we can and, and can't do. And uh, so that's what we're going to try to do today. And as I said, this is quite a forward-looking talk, so I normally skip over this slide, but my lawyers have told me I have to actually talk about it. So just be aware. I don't own the roadmap. I'm not telling you about the roadmap. I'm giving you a preview of the technology and read all the words there and uh, take them to heart. So with that, my marketing people very kindly added some slides to my deck, so I'll get through them quickly. Uh, we do have lots of customers who've bought NSX. That, these numbers go out of date as soon as we make the slide. Um, it's very rapidly getting adopted. Uh, we're adding a few production customers every week. We're way, way over 100 production customers now. And uh, lots of people have made a pretty big investment in NSX as well. Um, I will skip over this part because that's really what I'm going to talk about in the rest of the, the day. But uh, we will say um, NSX 6.2 came out uh, just before the VMworld event in San Francisco. And that is the most feature rich and most thoroughly tested release we've ever had. And so a lot of that experience we've had being in production over several years has now sort of gone into making NSX 6.2 the best release we've ever made. And I'll, today, as I talk about the architecture and technology, I'll try to call out some of the things which are already in the shipping product um, to distinguish them from the more forward-looking things I'll talk about. OK, so with that, we're actually into the presentation. And uh, I'm going to just start with two slides to set the context of where we are today with network virtualization, just to make sure everybody has a good understanding of the, of the foundation. And then we'll go into the more forward-looking piece. So NSX today is being used for a pretty wide range of different use cases. And I would say the set of use cases is actually expanding over time. That in the early days, we really were addressing a very particular pain point, which was that a lot of people were trying to provision data centers or provision applications or provision uh, services in either a public cloud environment or some kind of private cloud. And what they found was that they could get the compute part stood up pretty quickly. There was tools around by 2008. You could provision virtual machines automatically through self-service portals in a matter of, of minutes. But then that made the networking into the long pole. And you know, people who really worked hard on this still found that it took, you know, at best, a week to do all the steps you needed to do to provision a network, in particular because it's shared infrastructure. You can't afford to make a configuration change that breaks things. So it was now, you know, no matter how hard you tried, you could provision your compute in two minutes, network in you know, seven days to many months. And what we were able to do with uh, NSX in its early inc incarnations was to shrink that provisioning time from days or months down to minutes. And so now many people use NSX with some kind of automation system to provide 
very rapid deployment of networks coupled to, to virtual machines to provide sort of things like self-service clouds and whether it's a public or a private environment, automation has become a big use case. About 18 months ago, a combination of things happened in the security space, probably the most notable of which was an incredible number of very high profile hacks of big companies where they lost critical data. You, know, you would have heard probably of, of Target losing credit card data, Office of Personnel Management in the US losing all of their personnel data. Um, my wife, by the way, is a federal employee in the US and all of her personal data was compromised thanks to that hack. Um, so you know, this was a, th these things all happened because perimeter defenses were maybe 99.9% .9 effective, but the attacker only needs to be right once. And once they get into the data center, the lateral movement within a data center was rather unconstrained. And I've heard from a recent report, the average amount of time between an, in an intrusion and the detection of that attack is 205 days. During that time, attackers are free to move laterally within the data center because of a lack of controls. NSX microsegmentation tightly limits lateral movement within the data center. So that use case was very timely and it leverages some of the same features that we built for the automation use case, but also leverage things like the distributed firewall. And so all of a sudden we found ourselves with a very compelling reason for people to deploy NSX. So we went from tens to hundreds of customers, largely on the back of that micro-segmentation use case. We're actually finding today people may start with micro-segmentation and then say, oh, and now I can automate things, or now I can do something else. So it's a sort of a starter use case for some people. And then finally, application continuity, which is kind of a fancy word for high availability and disaster recovery, that's leveraging the fact that NSX and network virtualization decouples your network services from the physical infrastructure. And that means you can think of a network service as being independent of its physical location as well. So you can start thinking about things like taking my running network configuration, taking a snapshot of it, mirroring that to a backup data center and having a DR operation which can be done in a matter of minutes because I don't have to do any complicated re-IPing or net network changes. I can exactly replicate the network services from one place to another because networking is now fundamentally decoupled from the underlying hardware. So that's kind of the spectrum of use cases that we see for NSX and you know, the overall trend here is an increasing number of different uses and we find people thinking of NSX as almost as general purpose as compute virtualization. So we see, you know, we see a great opportunity there and uh, so I'm curious, how many people here are already NSX customers? Don't be shy. Wow, that's a very surprisingly small number of people. I actually had, in the, in the room that I had only 120 people, I had like 10 people who had it actually running in production. Um, so, uh, so don't take away the wrong um, impression from that little non-scientific survey that this is becoming quickly a mainstream technology that's being ad adopted across all kinds of different verticals. Okay, so. Um, with that little piece of sort of background, I want to focus on the architecture of NSX. Now, it used to be I'd spend an hour on the, on the architecture. Today, I'm going to spend one slide on the architecture, and then I'll move on to some of the more forward-looking material. So, uh, first of all, the, the uh, basic sort of data plane part of NSX is implemented as a set of software modules that run in the hypervisor. And so NSX provides this distributed data plane, and we'll talk a lot more about the importance of it being fully distributed. But we take functions that used to run in uh, the you know, functions that used to run in a physical device, and now we run those functions in software on a hypervisor, and we distribute them across the data center. So things like switching, routing, firewalling, load balancing can be implemented in the hypervisor. That means any networking function that you need can be delivered to the workloads that need it right next to those workloads. We also have a thing called the NSX Edge, which is an x86 appliance that enables us to bring traffic from the physical world into the virtual. And uh, the, uh, the hardware VTEP, which I'll talk about later, is something that we develop with our partners to enable us to bring traffic from physical workloads into virtual networks at high throughput in a, in a hardware form factor. So we have this distributed data plane where we deliver networking services in a way that's decoupled from the underlying hardware. 
the brains of NSX really reside in the NSX controller. The NSX controller is a, a scale-out, highly available collection of virtual machines that provide the uh, centralised computation and state management for the overall system. So if you've heard anything about software-defined networking, sort of the fundamental idea of software-defined networking is you have a distributed data plane and a centralised control point. But for that centralised control to be scalable, it needs to actually be logically centralised but implemented in a, a scale-out manner as, as we do. The sorts of things that happen in the NSX controller is it takes the desired view of a virtual network. Say you've got 10 VMs, you want them connected in some topology. That information is stored in the controller. The controller then looks at where those virtual machines are located, calculates what needs to be done to instantiate that virtual network, and pushes a set of rules out to the vSwitches so that that desired virtual network can be implemented in a distributed way. So you can almost think of the controller as the thing which takes the way the, you want the world to be, looks at the way the world is, and maps those two things together to bring about the desired outcome. And then sitting on top of that, we have what we call the NSX manager. The NSX manager is the place where a human normally interacts with the system, and the NSX manager uh, provides a GUI so that you can uh, specify what a virtual network should do. You can uh, monitor what a virtual network is doing. You can look at statistics and so on. And it also provides an entry point for APIs from other systems. So fundamental to the idea of automation of the provisioning of networks, the idea of agility driven by things like self-service portals, is that you can send a request to a single point and get a virtual network instantiated, even though that virtual network might span across multiple data centers or an entire data center and require touching tens or hundreds of hypervisors, you have a single entry point to say, I need a virtual network that looks like this. So the manager provides that. And then optionally, sitting above all of this, is a cloud consumption layer. So those people who are using NSX for some kind of automation typically have some kind of cloud automation layer. Um, the most common one is vRealize Automation, VMware's own product in that space. We have many customers using OpenStack. We also have people using other systems up there. From an NSX point of view, the only thing that we really need is we need something that can make API requests into the NSX manager. So that's the, the really, really quick introduction to what NSX looks like from an architecture point of view. Hopefully for most of you, there's nothing new there. Um, anybody want to ask one or two quick questions before we move on? I just want to make sure everybody's sort of happy and comfortable with the basics before we move on to the advanced stuff. So, uh, okay, I have a question or go. Okay, quick. Um, question here right in the front row. And microphone is coming. Hi, my question is, um, what's the maximum diameter, network diameter, between the control plane and the actual date program, programmable data plane component? Okay, so the question is about maximum network diameter of the, um, of the really, of the, of the, of the, the, what's the sort of largest network that we can support? So the, we do all kinds of different scale testing, and there's no sort of one number that, that we can give you as like the maximum um, that you can support. I can tell you that the largest deployments that we have today tend to be on the, on the order of several thousand servers. And those servers can be distributed across an arbitrarily large physical network. So it, you know, from a sort of traditional networking point of view, we don't sort of think so much about network diameter so much as how many different endpoints can we manage. And it's typically on the order of thousands is the sort of the upper limit that we test to. Um, I'll say the hardest thing about building a scalable system um, is actually testing at scale. Um, and so we, we have tended to run tests around the sort of two to three to 5,000 hypervisor number with sort of 100,000 virtual machines all controlled by a single NSX controller. Um, we don't actually have any customers who are operating at that scale today, um, but we have some who are close to that. So um, in general, I'm glad you asked the question. We put an enormous amount of focus on scale and uh, it, it's really having large scale customers in production that helps you figure out what to do at scale. So that we, we feel like we know how to build a scalable system and we've been able to keep up with our most demanding customers. Um, there was a, another question, did you, the microphone went? Um, oh, we've got one more. Um, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, practically, how does it work uh, or when you try to stretch the VLAN between two sides? Uh, do you have the NSX 
edge that manage this connection or it is uh, um, the data plane itself? Yeah, the, the question is how, how do we stretch the XLAN yeah. between, between two sites? We actually have a pretty wide range of different options for how you can stretch NSX between two sites. So it's actually possible to do tunnels between the edges and you can also do them directly between hypervisors. And I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit at the end, but for a really detailed discussion of multi-site deployments, there's actually like a whole one hour session on, on how to do multi-site. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on here. We will have some time for Q&A at the end, um, but thanks for those uh, sort of warm-up questions. So um, with that, um, we're gonna move now into sort of the, the advanced topics. And so I'm really gonna cover three things today in terms of, of new material. And I just wanted to mention, by the way, I see quite a few people taking photos, which is fine, and you're welcome to live tweet, live blog, whatever you want um, during the session. Um, we will get you access to all these slides. So VMworld uh, makes all of our slides available. I believe the session's being recorded as well. Um, so if you do ask a question, um, you can actually listen to yourself again as well. So we're, um, we're gonna talk now about um, physical networks and bare metal workloads. This is the uh, the, the work that we've done to make sure that people can connect both their virtual workloads and their non-virtualized workloads together in a unified way using NSX. Um, how many people here are 100 virtualized in their data centers? Yeah, that's always interesting. There's probably, you know, 3% 3, 3 or something like that. How many people here are, say, 50% virtualized? That seems to get the happy majority. Okay, I'm not gonna, I'll, I'll stop with the questions, but um, we kind of recognize that the 100% virtualized is sort of not that common. And so we've really built the system in a way that we can ad address both physical workloads and virtual workloads. That's what I wanna talk about now. We have quite a comprehensive set of offerings here. So what most people are doing today with NSX is they're doing something like what's shown on the top there. So we can use the NSX Edge as an x86 based appliance to bring traffic from the physical world into the virtual world. So for example, you can, you can either bridge or route from a single VLAN on a, an edge appliance into a logical network. So you can think of that as sort of a VLAN to, v, to VXLAN sort of mapping. It can be done either at L2 or L3. We can also apply services like firewalling at that edge. So that gives us a way that we can connect either north-south traffic from outside the data center or traffic from a bare metal workload into uh, your NSX environment. As of the sort of many, many pr production customers we have today, 98% of them are doing what's on the, on the top there. We just announced in NSX 6.2 the ability to do what's shown on the bottom, which is to uh, use a hardware partner's switch or router to bring traffic from the physical into the virtual. So this is where we, we take a, a, a switch or a router from one of our partners, we connect it up to NSX in the control plane, and now you can go into NSX and say, I would like port 20 on this particular switch to be bridged into the following logical network. So you can now start to think of switch ports as being available to your logical networking environment, just as VNICs and virtual machines are available in that environment. So you can start building these virtual networks that span the virtual and the physical. The advantage of the hardware approach is you get sort of hardware type throughput and you know, high port density devices. Um, for most people, the top solution is adequate because we can do on the order of 10 gigabits through a single appliance and you can deploy multiple appliance. But for people who have a lot of non-virtualized workloads and large data centers, the, the hardware approach is attractive. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time now talking about the future of what we're doing with our hardware partners, which is a program I've been directly involved in. So today, we, in what, what's in 6.2 is we do bridging with our hardware partners. There are two new things coming out in the, the forthcoming releases. The first one is distributed routing using our hardware partners. So I wanna talk about this from two perspectives. One is it's a new thing that we're doing with our hardware partners. Secondly, it's a good illustration of how distributed services work in virtual networking. So um, this is an example of distributed logical routing and I'm gonna go through it in a little bit of detail just to make everything as clear as I can. How many people here are networking people primarily? Yeah, maybe a third quarter of the audience. Um, so this maybe will make more sense to those people because I just want to, to help you understand that you've probably grown up thinking of a router as like a box. You can walk up to it, you can, you can plug things into it and you know, packets go there and they get routed. A distributed router is a bit different. 
it's distributed across multiple physical entities, and you can't walk up to it and point to it. Um, and so I want to explain a little bit about how that works. So the router, as I said, is distributed. So what does that mean? Well, let's look at, at the simple process of sending a packet from one machine to another. And I'm going to walk through the process of how you do address resolution and then send a packet. So the first thing that happens before a virtual machine can send a packet to that physical machine, which, and they're on different logical subnets in, in, in this example, that virtual machine is going to send an ARP request to its logical router, its default gateway. So we send the ARP request, it gets intercepted at the local hypervisor in the vSwitch, and a response comes back or not. There we go. Um, so the, uh, so, so the, the ARP is intercepted and replied. So at this point, the virtual machine says, OK, I know where my logical router is. I, I, I know what its MAC address is. I can send a packet. Now the logical router is going to ARP for the destination, which in this case is the hardware device. And then it's going to reply with its MAC address and so now the logical router knows how to get to the destination. So now we can send packets, and they go through that hypervisor. So they're getting routed at that sort of uh, left-hand turn there, or the, the, the place where it turns horizontal. That's where, the, that's where the routing's happening. OK, so you say, OK, I can see where the router is. Now look, let's look at the other direction. So now this hardware device ARPs for its logical router, and it gets a response back from the local top-of-rack switch, the hardware VTEP. And so then it tries to send a packet, and now the hardware VTIP is going to ARP for the destination. So the ARP request goes out, it hits the destination, and the response comes back. And so now the logical router knows how to forward a packet. And so now when packets are getting forwarded, they go through the hardware VTIP, they get routed there, and delivered to the destination. And then there's a third case, which is the virtual to virtual, which I'll skip in the interest of time. So at this point, all three of those devices are participating in the implementation of a single logical router. So that's what I mean by a distributed logical router. So this is something that we've worked on with our hardware partners for a while. We have a pretty good design on how to make this work. And essentially, you can think of NSX receives from above, from the, the manager, a description of what the logical network should look like, which could include, I want this physical workload connected to these logical, these virtual workloads. And then NSX is going to go and send information to the hardware VTIP to describe exactly how it can participate in that distributed logical router. And then everything happens kind of as I showed in that picture. So this is uh, designed and in the works. But hopefully you can understand now that A, we will, in the not too distant future, be able to do logical routing through our hardware VTIPs. And B, that we will. Um, fully distribute that just the way we do so many other things in a fully distributed way. T today, that, that example that I just showed would actually be a pretty good description of how things work if you had a software uh, edge providing that service as well. The next thing I want to talk about in the hardware VTEP space is how we ap apply security policies. So you might have seen a picture like this before where this is kind of illustrating how micro-segmentation can be applied that with NSX, you can very easily segment different groups of machines into their own logical networks. That's kind of what logical or virtual networking is about. It's very inexpensive to create isolated virtual networks. So, and, and then also you can go and apply very fine-grained firewall policies to describe exactly which machine can talk to which machine on which port. So you'd probably like this to also work if some of those machines are physical. So, so one of the things that I've been working on over the summer is uh, making this work in the environment where our hardware partners are providing the connectivity to the physical world. And uh, so again, a little picture of like what the logical picture is at the top. A couple of virtual machines connected to a logical router with a physical machine hanging off that. And the ideal is we'd like to create some kind of security policy that says these VMs can talk to this physical machine, but only on certain ports. And so if you think about how we would implement that in the physical world, we would, we would go and uh, apply firewall rules using the NSX distributed firewall 
right next to those VMs inside the hypervisor. And then we can also go and configure access control lists by conveying the security policy from NSX to the hardware VTEP. By the way, who here knows what VTEP stands for? Virtual Tunnel Endpoint. Virtual Tunnel Endpoint. You get 75% for that. It's VXLAN Tunnel Endpoint. It's actually a nested acronym. Um, but uh, th th it's very close, and thank you for playing. Um, and I could maybe get you a new T-shirt. Um, so the uh, right. So, so anyway, so the VXLAN Tunnel Endpoint is the is the, uh, the acronym I should have explained earlier. Uh, so what you see here is that we are able to take a security policy, configure it in NSX, and then implement that across both the physical and the virtual. So this is, as I said, something we started working on over the summer. And just to show you, I'm not making this up. Um, this is actually the Git commit that went into um, the Open vSwitch project just a couple of weeks ago. Um, one of my very, very few contributions to Open vSwitch and one of the actually small occasions where I actually do useful work other than giving talks. So we've, we've got this um, patch um, into Open vSwitch now. And just to, to clarify, um, the, the protocol that we use between the NSX controller and these third-party hardware VTEPs is called the Open vSwitch database protocol. It's an open source protocol that's been around for quite a few years. And we've extended it in such a way that it enables us to communicate between NSX and third-party hardware. And by using this open source project, we've made it very easy for any hardware partner who wants to, to pick this up, put that open source on their, on their switch, and then integrate it into their system. So we have, I've lost track of how many hardware partners now who've implemented this, but it's most of the people that you would um, expect to find in, in this kind of business. Um, and that's, that's a bit of the documentation that it comes with Open vSwitch. It just shows you kind of all the things that you can do when you configure an access control list on a hardware VTEP using NSX. This is really just to show you that it's real. I didn't just make it up. So uh, with that, I, I want to just uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about tunneling. Um, this is particularly for the, for the sort of the traditional networking people in the room, that people seem to spend an inordinate amount of time arguing about tunnels. Um, I've been doing networking for over 25 years, and I hate to think how many years I've wasted arguing about tunnel formats. So in the network virtualization world, tunneling pr performs an important function. It essentially gives us an abstraction that enables us to run virtual networks in a way that's decoupled from the physical network because we encapsulate the virtual traffic in a tunnel header. Beyond that, it doesn't really matter that much what kind of tunnel we use. There's certain performance differences that change over time depending on hardware generations. But so today we sometimes use a tunneling protocol called STT to get to communicate between hypervisors. We almost always use VXLAN to tunnel between hypervisors and third party hardware because that's what the third party hardware supports. The analogy I like to make is this is like choosing the correct cables for your data center. It's important you choose the right ones. You, need, you can't plug fiber into a Cat5 twisted pair socket, but, or you can, but it won't do you any good. So you should choose the right cables. But don't imagine that the cabling is the most important aspect of your data center architecture. Similarly, this is kind of a low-level detail for network virtualization. Um, now, there's a lot of different standards for tunneling, and in a traditional networking approach, when you have too many standards, you solve the problem by creating one more standard. And so we did that by coming up with a new tunneling protocol called GENEV. GENEV stands for Generic Network Virtualization Encapsulation. And our idea here was to try to take the best things from all of the existing tunneling protocols and do that in a way that would be flexible enough that we wouldn't have to go and define another one next year. And so I'll show you a GENEV header in a moment. But we're going to start initially deploying GENEV between software endpoints because it's very easy for us to change the header format in software. But we will then, at some later point, start using it to talk to hardware as the hardware ecosystem starts to catch up. And on that point, um, if you look at the bottom of this slide, there's already quite a lot of hardware support for GENEV. It's um, supported by most of the major NIC vendors and several major switch ASIC vendors. It's not yet been fully picked up by the OEMs who build switches with that 
that silicon, but from a silicon point of view, there's a lot of support. And even your favorite monitoring tools like um, Wireshark can also understand Genev headers today. And it's in various software things like Linux and Open vSwitch. And then on the top there, I've got a picture of the packet header, which is really for the hardcore networking people in the audience, because it's not a proper networking talk otherwise. The only really interesting thing there is that the top, the top two bits of the, um, or the top two words of that um, Genev header look very much like a VXLAN header. Um, but then after that, there's a, a set of variable options. And, and that's really powerful because it means we can keep on extending this protocol as we come up with new ideas. And this has been something we've done a lot over the seven or eight years we've been doing network virtualization is if you want to add some new capability to your virtual network, it's great if you can just stick that information into an extensible header and carry it from one end of the network to the other. So a good example there is when we start encrypting traffic, uh, as we will probably do sometime next year, it'd be great to be able to carry information about the security context from one end of the tunnel to the other. And so this gives us a way to do that. Okay, so I often run into people who say, you know, I'm very worried about deploying overlays because I'm afraid I won't have any visibility into how my overlay is interacting with my underlay. How many people have heard some kind of comment like that? Uh, okay, well, you've all heard it now. Um, so let me now debunk the thing that I just told you. So the short answer to this question is, no, it's not true that you don't get good visibility. In fact, I would like to make the opposite claim that with network virtualization, you get visibility that you've never seen before, uh, that this is actually the most visibility that networking has ever had. And so let me try to back up that claim. With NSX and with network virtualization in general, we have a fundamental principle, which is that if you're going to virtualize something, you have to recreate everything that existed in the physical version of that thing. That's what virtualization means. So a virtual machine has all the same properties as a physical machine all the way down to the instruction set. A virtual network has to have all the same properties as a physical network all the way down to things like SNMP and uh, you know, things like syslog and NetFlow. So as a baseline, we put all the things that you're accustomed to using to monitor your network into virtual networks. Then we also add other things that you couldn't do in a physical network. So my favorite example of that is Traceflow. Traceflow is a new feature in 6.2 where you can synthetically inject a packet that looks like it came from a VM, but you inject it in the software switching layer. It goes through the, the switching pipeline. It gets switched, routed, firewalled, tunneled, sent across the physical network, and then switched, routed, firewalled again, and delivered to the, uh, to the VNIC but intercepted right before it would be handed to the VM. So you can completely troubleshoot the path between two VMs using a synthetically generated packet. And if anything goes wrong at any one of those seven steps that I mentioned, you can figure out which one it was. So maybe there's an incompatible set of, of firewall rules that's blocking this packet. And you can detect that because the trace flow packet will tell you. If it's a physical problem, you'll see, well, it went into the tunnel, but it didn't come out the other end. So I guess that tunnel is the thing I need to troubleshoot. So this is a kind of debugging for networks that we've never had before. And it can, again, all be done from one central point. You don't have to go shooting around in the network saying, is it that switch? Is it that link? You start from the central location and you work from there. So it's an incredible way to get access to troubleshooting that we've never had before. Now, on top of that, you do need to understand what's going on in the physical network. NSX has only a limited amount of information about the physical network, but third-party tools can be built which can talk to NSX to get all this information about the virtual network and can talk to the physical world and then provide that unified view in a single pane of glass. And so I've been saying this for quite a long time and I finally realized that people didn't always believe me if I couldn't actually show such a tool. So I'm going to show you a tool in a couple of minutes. I'll use vRealize operations as an example, but also down the bottom is a, a selection of our uh, monitoring partners who can also monitor both the physical and the virtual. And so for example, Arkin is a new company that's 100% focused on troubleshooting these environments where there's a physical network and virtual networks running on top of it. 
Um, but the other companies are more traditional companies. They've always known how to do physical, and they can now also point their tools at the virtual layer and give you a unified view from end to end. And as I said, even things like Wireshark work beautifully on, uh, on virtualized networks. So whatever your favorite tool is, either it already works with NSX or it can be made to work with NSX. So this is the demo I'm going to show you in a moment. Uh, we're just going to show the troubleshooting process between a couple of VMs trying to figure out a connectivity problem. We've got a, a leaf spine architecture and we're using VROps to, uh, to show you what's going on. This is a tech preview, so remember the disclaimer I showed you at the beginning, um, but we are actively developing this product. So here's the demo. It's recorded, by the way, because I'm a nervous person. Um, so on the left, you see the NSX components, and on the right, you see some physical components, leaf switches and spine switches. This is a VROps dashboard. shows you the health of everything. Green, as you might imagine, is good. So we see everything's healthy. We see some alerts in the middle because this is a very, very minimal configuration. We didn't follow all the best practices. Now we're going to troubleshoot the connectivity between two VMs. So we select VM1 and VM2, and we're going to see what's the state of connectivity between them. At the bottom, we're getting the physical view, and right above it, we're getting the, the logical view. So you can see that we're clicking over some physical objects, leaf switch switches, spine switches, and you could look at each of those, and they all look pretty healthy, and you can also see the hosts and the VMs. And above that, you see the very simple logical topology, two VMs connected to a logical switch. So now we're going to go in and, in traditional demo form, we're going to go and break something. So let's go and shut down an interface on one of the switches and see what happens. So first thing you'll see is a big red badge over there because one of the switches is unhealthy. Uh, so let's figure out a little bit more about what's going on. Well, we can now see the logical topology looks pretty good because we had redundancy in the physical network. But in the physical picture, you see now where the problem is, and you can now say, oh, well, I've lost my redundancy. I should probably go and fix that before it becomes a real problem. And so we can go and drill down on that physical problem and see a little bit more about what's going on. So if we drill down, we can see the time series of events that's been happening on this particular trouble spot. And you can see there's a symptom of interface down, generally a fairly serious problem. And you can see the time series of it going down, coming back up, going down again. And probably that's because we, we did a few dry runs of the demo. And right now it's down. And so now you could actually see, oh, it's probably a flapping interface. It might be a, a real world scenario, which you would then want to go and troubleshoot. So now we're going to go back and fix that. In this case, pretty easy to fix by putting the interface back up again. And now we'll go and look again at how that shows up in VROps. So everything is good and green again. Uh, nice green leaf switches, spine switches. And finally, we'll go and try to check out the logical connectivity and physical connectivity again by selecting those two VMs and asking the system to build the, both the logical view and the physical view. And again, you see it goes off and it, it does its magic. And this is a pretty simple demo. Um, we just um, used SNMP to build the physical topology. Uh, it's not exactly rocket science, but it is a open standard, easy way to go and talk to physical networks. Um, partners have the option of building more advanced management packs that could plug in to uh, VROps and give more sophisticated information. So mostly what I wanted to show there was a single pane of glass, logical view, physical view, very easy to troubleshoot problems. That's hopefully a good message to take away as you think about how you would start to operationalize NSX. And I should mention in passing that the operational aspects of NSX are something we've invested a lot of energy in in the last six months, because this is no longer a, a question of us persuading people that the architecture makes sense or that the system scales or that we have some feature. This is about getting people into production. And so you know, we've now been surveying our production customers figuring out what they need to be successful, understanding their best practices, and then feeding that back to the next round of customers who are going into production. So 
uh, hopefully that gives you a little bit of flavour of some of the work we're doing. There's actually several presentations this week on operational aspects of NSX. So I want to talk for the next few minutes about distributed services. Distributed services are really fundamental to the NSX architecture. So not everything in this section is new, but it's really important that you go away understanding how fundamental distributed services are, because the future of NSX is largely about expanding the set of distributed services that we offer. So first thing about distributed services, we implement everything that we can implement in the hypervisor, which means every time you add a new server to run some new workloads, you get a new set of capacity to deliver those services. We have customers running NSX with terabits of east-west firewalling capacity. If you want to deploy a terabit of firewalling capacity in your data center today, you're talking about a lot of boxes and a lot of dollars, or euros, I guess, to, de to deploy that. We have customers who just use NSX to get terabits of east-west capacity because it scales out with their data centers. The next thing about distributed services is that because these services are implemented inside the hypervisor, we can apply the services right next to the workloads that need them. That means we can apply them at very fine granularity. So for example, you can create a firewall rule that says two virtual machines that are in the same logical subnet are not allowed to talk to each other. They should only be forwarding traffic to a different subnet. This is not something you can typically do in the physical world, but we can apply those services right at the VNIC. This is the heart of micro-segmentation, the ability to provide very fine-grained services. Think about two virtual machines in the web tier of a three-tier application. They should be taking traffic from the internet and forwarding it to the application tier. If they start forwarding it to each other, that's a sign that something's wrong, possibly a compromise. So we can block that and detect it and log it. And that's the kind of granularity you get by applying services at the VNIC. The other thing is that because we apply these services in the hypervisor, we can take advantage of what the hypervisor knows about the endpoints. We know what operating system is running. We can find out what user is logged in and what groups those user belongs to. We can uh, find out things like what applications are running. And even administrative things, you can just tag a set of virtual machines with the, the, the tag web, and, and then they'll get the web policy. That can even be done before the virtual machine is created. So as virtual machines are instantiated, they can be tagged and automatically get the correct security policy. So no more going around configuring firewall rules based on IP address. So a lot of things become possible because of contextual information. And then finally, as I already just demonstrated, we get incredible visibility because we're looking at every packet as it goes from guest to, uh, as it goes from, from the guest to the physical network. And so all the things that I showed you for troubleshooting, they can also be used for other things like security. So this is incredibly powerful. And so the future for us is largely about leveraging that ability to do context-aware, scale-out distributed services. And just to drive this point home, on the left is the old way of doing things. You want to firewall something when the traffic's going between two VMs, you'd have to pull it out of the host, send it across the network to some choke point, and then bring it back in a hairpin or a trombone. In NSX, that same operation is done by just going through the vSwitch with the, the embedded distributed firewall. And if you were going between two different hosts, the packet would just follow the shortest path across the physical network, but still it gets the firewall services right there at the VNIC. This also is the mechanism by which we insert third-party services. And I want to mention that we really fundamentally believe that the future of networking is in software. And we want to virtualize all of networking. But you know, we can't do everything in the hypervisor kernel. You probably don't want to completely reassemble long streams of TCP data and do deep packet inspection inside the hypervisor. We're also not the world's experts when it comes to things like application recognition or application delivery controllers. We're fundamentally a, a, an infrastructure layer, a platform that people who specialize in things like intrusion detection or firewalling or load balancing can plug their services in. So what we can do in NSX is we can receive the packets at the VNIC and selectively forward them to third-party services 
so that they can get this additional layer of inspection or, or whatever is necessary. And so we view our partner ecosystem as really fundamental to what we're doing here, and that's a subset of the partners who are integrated with NSX using this mechanism today. Um, in the forward-looking department, we just released a tech preview of distributed load balancing. And I'll try to explain this quickly. The first time I heard about this, I, I was kind of a little bit perplexed because I thought, well, how can you distribute a load balancer? Isn't a load balancer a thing that you send packets to it and it distributes them? But in fact, if you think about east-west load balancing, you're actually taking packets from one tier of a multi-tier application and distributing it to another tier of that application. So you're taking packets from multiple places and distributing them to multiple places. It's a perfect place to apply a distributed service. And so this is what we've done in, uh, in 6.2 as, as a tech preview, and it will show up in the product in the future as a you know, fully supported feature. But to show an example here, traffic going from the web tier to the app tier, we'd like it to be load balanced. What you can do is you can say, I'm, I'm going to create a group of candidate machines, and I'll let NSX figure out how to distribute the traffic among those candidates. So NSX can go and look at the health of those VMs. Are they running hot? Are the CPUs overloaded? Have they gotten stuck and have stopped doing useful work? If so, don't load balance traffic to them. If they're healthy, put them in the candidate pool, and now you can distribute flows from one VM to another so that, for example, as shown on the right, we see traffic going from this VM to this application VM and some other flows going this way. And you can think of a distributed load balancer as being just like a clever distributed router. It just takes packets, it looks at where they need to go, and it sends them there, but it does it based on information in the L4 header rather than just the IP address. So that's a kind of, kind of cool thing. Um, we're also um, starting to work on distributed encryption, and uh, that's another thing which you know, is, uh, is still in development. But uh, leveraging the fact that we can apply these services in the hypervisor and using NSX to simplify things like key management. And people always ask, well, <clears throat> isn't there a big cost doing all these clever things in the hypervisor? And so I wanted to show this graph, which is t taken from about a year ago using not exactly state-of-the-art hardware that shows we can saturate a 10 gig NIC in both directions when applying these services. You can see that there's a bit of a drop-off for, as you move to very short message sizes. But for normal workloads, we can get quite close to saturating the NIC. And it's reasonably independent, even of things like how many firewall rules you have. This is just an example of the data that we have. We do put a lot of effort into performance. But the, um, the main sort of focus here is to say, when you have the packet in the hypervisor, it's fairly inexpensive to do additional things to it, providing you're not doing anything that requires you to reassemble long streams of, of, of data. So if you have the packet and you can look at the header, you can do things like a load balancing operation or a firewalling operation because you already had the packet in memory. That's reasonably inexpensive, and this data kind of backs that up. How many people here have heard something about DPDK? Wow, the Intel marketing team is not as strong in Europe as they are in some other places. Well, I'll, I'll go over this real quickly. DPDK is an amazing set of, of sort of libraries to help x86 packet forwarding go faster. Um, I, I, I have a whole rant on DPDK, but I'll save it today in the interest of time and just say we're starting to use DPDK in some aspects of our product to get really high packet performance through things like the NSX Edge. But if you take away one thing today, it's that DPDK is kind of cool, but it's neither necessary nor sufficient for high performance. Um, and I think I'll just I'll leave it at that. If you want to know more about DPDK, there's lots of information on the, on the web. But if somebody tells you, I need DPDK because I need high performance, you should be a little skeptical. But not to, not to denigrate it, it's a cool technology, but it's maybe a little bit ahead of its, uh, the, the, I'd say the hype is a little bit ahead of the reality, perhaps. OK, let's move right along. We've just got a few minutes left. Um, I just wanted to spend the last few minutes before we go to Q&A giving you a kind of a taste of the future in terms of how we're extending NSX from one data center to multiple data centers. I think a year ago, we were just starting to talk about NSX between multiple data centers. Today, of the hundreds of production customers we have, I'd say almost 10% are doing something around multi-data center use cases. Um, so 
We have a couple of things that are supported in the product today. You can take NSX and run either a stretched cluster between two fairly nearby data centers, <clears throat> or you can run multiple vCenters, one per data center, and, and have NSX extend networks between multiple different data centers. You can also use NSX for disaster recovery to actually migrate entire networks from one data center to another, or you can stretch networks from a data center to another data center. So a lot of capability in the product today, but we have a lot more that we want to do. Um, we often hear people asking about federation. Um, I'll, I'll say a little more about that, but the main idea of federation is that we can let you have sort of largely autonomous data centers, but you can still build virtual networks that will interconnect those autonomous data centers. So it's a more loosely coupled approach. I'll say more on that in a minute. And then we definitely see a very interesting opportunity around extending, <clears throat> extending network virtualization to the branch. So this is not an area where we have anything in our product today um, well, we have very limited capabilities in the product today, but there's a, a pretty interesting collection of startup companies who are starting to extend the, the concepts of software-defined networking out to branch offices, and we're starting to partner with those companies so that we can offer a micro-segmentation solution in the data center that can then be extended out to the branch. So this is just an area that I'll sort of flag for future interest that we see NSX having a much bigger impact than just within the data center. So um, I put this chart together just because there are so many different options, it gets a bit confusing. The, the three options on the left are all available in the product today, and they kind of give you some slightly different trade-offs depending on whether you're talking about sort of metro data centers that are close together or geographically distributed data centers that are further apart. And then the very right-hand column is something that I'll touch on in the next slide, the idea of using MPLS to provide a more federated solution between different data centers and also for a way of interconnecting with MPLS networks. So how many people today connect to an MPLS service provider? Probably half. How many people here run their own MPLS network? Quite a, quite a good number. Um, so th this next bit is probably most interesting for the people who run their own MPLS network. Um, so let me just go through it fairly quickly, but it also gives you just a quick sketch of what a federated approach to multi-data center would look like. Here you have two essentially independent data centers running two separate NSX installations, but the goal here is to provide a virtual network for, for a set of tenants where tenant A has resources in both one data center and the other data center. So we're going to go in, use the NSX API, create some virtual networking on, on the first site. We could go and do the same thing on the other side and create a virtual network there. And then using multi-protocol BGP, we can advertise the network of tenant A between one site and the other site. And there's a fair bit of detail there that I'm going to have to skip over, but multi-protocol BGP is the fundamental underpinning of MPLS VPNs, and it gives you a very clean way of exchanging tenant information between different data centers so you can make sure that tenant A on one side gets connected to tenant A on the other side and not to tenant B or C. And you can do this with an MPLS network in the middle if you run your own MPLS network, but you can also do it just with an IP uh, network in the middle and you can tunnel across that IP network. So this is just a, a very quick sketch of how federation might look um, in the future. Okay, so it brings me to my final slide and then we'll have a couple of minutes for Q&A. So today I've mostly talked about forward-looking things about NSX. Um, and I actually want you to go away thinking not just that NSX has a lot of cool new stuff that's coming down the road, but that NSX is actually mainstream today. That we have a lot of people in production and they're not leading edge customers. We have small banks, big banks, healthcare companies using NSX in production today, carrying mission critical traffic. So don't go away being intimidated by the amount of new information. Uh, don't be put off by the fact that only a handful of people in the room put up their hands when I ask for NSX customers. That, that's a weird selection bias, I suppose. Um, that th this, is, this is a seriously ready for prime time technology. I also, I hope you understood from what I discussed today that we have a really unique position in 
the, in the sort of the architecture of the modern data center. A lot of what we do depends on inserting services into the hypervisor. Obviously, VMware is uniquely well positioned to do that in vSphere, but we also make massive contributions to the Open vSwitch project. Uh, you saw one of mine. I'm, I'm like contributor number, I don't know, 100 on the list of most prolific contributors to Open vSwitch. But we have eight of the top 10 contributors to Open vSwitch working for VMware to insert features and services into Open vSwitch so that we can work in multi-hypervisor environments. So what, much as we love vSphere, we also understand that customers want choice and we can extend all the kind of services I've described today into multi-hypervisor environments. But th this ability to insert services into the hypervisor is really fundamental to what network virtualization is all about. And it's so different from any kind of hardware-based approach to networking. And finally, I, I hope because I talked about a fair amount of new stuff today, that you get a sense of how much runway we have in front of us to do exciting, innovative things and to grow into new opportunities. Um, I think I've said this every year for the last three years. I'm, I'm kind of an old networking person at this point. I, I started my career in networking in 1988. Um, does make me feel very old. But I've actually never been more excited about networking than I am now because this is a sort of once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to really transform networking from kind of a, a box-based industry to a software industry and to make networking manageable, agile, innovative, and to let you adopt new technologies into your business so that you can be more agile and more innovative. So I think this is a fantastic opportunity. I'm excited to be part of it. I hope you are excited too. So I'm going to encourage you to go learn more about NSX. Here's a, a, a list of some of my favorite sessions. Some of these are probably already over, but you, can probably, you should be able to get all of these online at vmworld.com. You may be able to catch a few of them before the end of the show this week. Um, this morning's keynote covered some really interesting topics. So if you didn't see the keynote this morning, you should go watch that recording. And, and finally, I'll just say we have an awesome ecosystem. I want to give a shout out to all the partners we work with. And th there's a lot of resources that you can go to to learn more about NSX. So thank you very much. Uh, I, I'd like to say it's been great to have the opportunity to talk to you. And I'm happy now to finish and take your questions. Thank you very much. And while you're getting ready for questions, I'll just say there is a chance to give survey responses. And if you do fill out the survey, you can win stuff. Um, but only do the survey if you like the session, I'd say. Uh, yes, for you. Sir, with the, the ready for any theme, what's your outlook for software-defined networking to say, say, AWS and Azure to be up on stage sometime in the future talking about their participating in, uh, in this SDN world? So that's a, that's a great question. What, you know, what, do I, what do I see with, with Azure and AWS? So if you saw the keynote this morning, you would have seen a demo of us actually extending NSX to control a workload, workload running on AWS. That's, it's not in the product yet, but we have a clear vision of how we can extend NSX into public clouds. Now, will Amazon stand up and say, you know, we embrace what VMware is doing? I, I don't want to necessarily predict that. Um, I know Azure actually they themselves have a network virtualization solution that runs inside AWS for AWS workloads. To some extent, they have embraced the same vision that we have. It's just that they're putting it to their own ends, which is to drive more Azure business. Um, again, will we collaborate with them? We'll certainly make sure, or I, I hope we will make sure that you can run workloads in Azure and extend networking and security policies from your on-premise workloads to your Azure workloads or move things back and forth. Um, since this is such a great question, I'll just say part of our long-term vision is that wherever your workload runs, NSX provides the security for it and the network services, whether it's in a public cloud, on a vSphere hypervisor, an open source hypervisor, in a container, on a mobile. We don't really mind. We want to pr be providing services for all of those kind of workloads. Great question, thanks. Um, other, other questions? There are people running around with microphones. You just need to raise your hand. There's one in the front row here. Um, could you tell us something about supporting the Nexus uh, uh, 1000V in, in the future? Um, sure, so uh, I'll, I'll, start, I'll start by saying a slightly, the question is, can, will we support the Nexus 1000V in the future? Um, 
So short answer to that is we do not plan to support the Nexus 1000V in the future. We've had a lot of experience with what it takes to provide a robust vSwitch in the hypervisor, and we've decided that that's the, the third-party vSwitches are not the right way forward for us. Um, I will say we are extremely supportive of Cisco in general. Um, I'd say the most common underlay for an NSX deployment is probably a Nexus 7K-based underlay. And we have a lot of Nexus 9K-based underlays as well. So we're very supportive of running on top of Cisco hardware. Um, we're not planning to support a, a, a Cisco vSwitch um, because of the many, many challenges of supporting a third-party vSwitch. OK, thank you. Yes. Will NSX be delivered on top of other hypervisors in the future or only on vSphere? So, Will NSX be delivered on top of other hypervisors in the future? So today you can run NSX on KVM, SEN, and vSphere. Um, in the future, we will certainly continue to support KVM, the most popular open source hypervisor. Um, I think there's, we have at least a, a architectural plan for Hyper-V. I don't know if that'll make it in the product, but uh, the, the short answer is we are 100% committed to multi-hypervisor support. See the timeline to convert from VTEPs to GTEPs to support Geneve? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, and nice coining of the GTEP phrase there. Um, so uh, the, I, I don't know exactly what the timeline is going to be. So we know the silicon exists today to do Geneve. Um, that silicon is actually in some existing shipping products. So the only thing standing between the availability of Geneve capable um, GTEPs is uh, the software from the, the OEMs. Um, so I think as soon as we start to see um, some customer demand for that and we get our product a little bit further along in terms of actually leveraging the Geneve extensibility, then I think we'll see it. If I had to guess, a couple of years. But I, I want to make an important point. You should have no anxiety about build, buying VXLAN capable switches today because A, we'll support them forever, or at least you know, a good definition of, of forever is, you know, many years, and that in many cases it's actually the same silicon supports both VXLAN and Geneve. So don't be put off by the sort of, oh no, the, the encapsulation is changing. Remember, it's just a low level detail. Um, other, yeah, there's another question yep. right, right there. Here? Oh. Um, yep. uh, yeah, saying here, saying here is extremely difficult. Um, <laughs> okay, I think we're over by um, the Got it. Will NSX be the requirement for um, future integration of um, agentless network security modules like IDS, IPS modules uh, from Trend Micro Deep Security, or will there be like a free version API um, within vSphere? Ooh, that's a, that's a good question. So, will we have a non-NSX way of supporting agentless? Uh, antivirus type, yes. type things. I d honestly don't know the answer to that question, so congratulations on stumping the professor. Um, but I will, um, I will try to get you an answer if you want to follow up with me and we'll swap cards at the end. Okay. Perfect. Are we um, I think we are. I still okay, have a I think, mic. Okay, I think you may be the last question here. Okay. Yeah. Um, a more specific question. Uh, currently you are supporting only 8V Center, at least that's what we've been told. Um, are there plans to, to test more than just 8V centers? So within one NSX manager, you can basically, yeah. uh, that's what you're saying. Yeah, so, so today we, we, do, we have run tests up to 8V centers, which is you know, roughly, I'd say, 6V centers more than, than the largest customer is using today. Um, so there's no reason we couldn't test. Um, so in terms of actual production NSX customers, we, we, we've, um, we have tested 8V eight, eight centers. Um, our long-term plan is actually to completely decouple NSX from vCenter. So if you look at our um, multi-hypervisor customers today, they don't have any vCenters at all. And so those are the ones who, who have the sort of thousands of hypervisors. Um, certainly if we have customers who need NSX to run across very large numbers of vCenters, I'd say the most likely approach will be they'll be doing it in a way that's more decoupled from, from the, the vCenter. Uh, certainly the hardest thing about scaling, apart from building a system that scales, is testing all the different possible combinations at scale. So I, th I think at that point we should probably wrap it up. And again, thank you very much, and don't forget the surveys.